Historical Marathon. The best episodes of Naval Legends for those who haven't seen them and those who are keen to re-watch them. At the end of Marathon, we'll publish a brand new episode about Greek cruiser Georgios Avarov. Look for special codes in each and every episode of our History Marathon. As with our in-game daily shipments, all the gifts will be revealed in advance. If you're hungry for more, you'll have a chance to double the haul of gifts through your actions. If we manage to reach a set number of new subscribers within a 24-hour period, we'll double the number of gifts for the code. You can find more information on our website. Don't forget to subscribe, as there are more bonus codes to come. Mistocles once said that he who commands the sea has command of everything. And the Greeks have had a long naval tradition since those days. Which brings us to Georgos Averroff, the last built and last surviving of the armored cruisers. The Greeks, she's not just a monument of steel and engineering, she's a national treasure. And the Hellenic Navy Jack and the Admiral's flag indicate that this is still a warship in commissioned service. As a result, any passing Hellenic Navy ships are required to render honors. Welcome to Athens. After the unfortunate war against Turkey in 1897, Greece was trying to upgrade their armed forces. In 1907, the Greek Naval Command learned that two pizza-class armored cruisers were being built at the shipyards of an Italian company called Orlando. The Italians wanted to sell one of those cruisers. The Turks were also interested in the ship, but weren't able to send a request in time due to financial issues. <laughs> But we had a great advantage. We had a benefactor, Yorgos Avarov. According to his will, he had left a large sum of money for that time to the country. Eight million gold drachmas. The money was used to purchase the ship. It was enough to cover a third of the cruiser's cost. Thus, we were able to buy the ship and named her after our benefactor, Yorgos Avarov. For the ambitious Greek Navy, she was the mightiest ship they possessed and became a source of pride for the Greeks from the moment she was commissioned into service. A snout bow is the element of the cruiser's appearance that draws most attention. That design feature was brought by the legacy of ancient triremes, and it was common to all warships of the steam-powered, armor-clad fleet era. Simply put, Averoff was the last armored cruiser to be commissioned in the world. Performance characteristics of cruiser Yorgos Averoff in 1911. Length, 140.5 meters. Beam, 21 meters. Draft, 7.5 meters. Total displacement, 10,400 tons. Armament. Main caliber, four 234 millimeter Mark 10 guns. Medium caliber, eight 190 millimeter Mark VI guns coupled in four turrets. Secondary armament, 16 76 mm guns. The cruiser was armed with three 430 mm underwater torpedo tubes. Armor, belt up to 200 mm, deck 50 mm. Main turrets, 200 mm. Conning tower, 180 mm. Propulsion, two steam engines and 22 Belleville boilers. Power, 20,808 horsepower. Top speed, 24 knots. Cruising range, 2,480 miles at 17.5 knots. 
The ship was commissioned into service in May 1911, but after leaving the shipyard, she set out not to Greece, but to England. There she would participate in the festivities dedicated to the coronation of King George V. After the parade, the cruiser ran aground and was sent to Plymouth for repairs. As was common with a lot of fleets at the time, the relationship between officers and enlisted was not always idyllic. But if you bear in mind that after accepting delivery, the crew were sent not back home to Greece to work out the kinks and become a smoothly operating machine, but to an international review, and then you add an incident with the ship running aground, you can imagine that tensions were starting to run a little bit high. The cup of patience overflowed, however, one day in July 1911, when for lunch the crew were served this. It's a Stilton, apparently a close relative to the Rock Four, and considered a delicacy. Now, the Greek sailors, who were a little bit more used to their native feta, did not understand the sophistication involved in eating this. And frankly, I'm inclined to agree. Angered at having been served moldy cheese, the crew rebelled. Now, the rebellion was put down without the use of violence, but both the commander and the instigators of the rebellion were recalled back to Greece. And Pavlos Kudryotis was sent as a matter of some haste to England where he was then appointed as the new CEO. The appointment of Pavlos Kontroliotis as commander at helm of the most modern ship of the Greek Navy was quite appropriate. He was born into a family of a famous political figure. At the age of 20, he started his service in the Greek Navy. He fought in the Greco-Turkish War of 1897. Three years later, he was the first in the Greek Navy to cross the Atlantic Ocean while being at the helm of training ship Miaoulis. Thanks to his strong-willed character and the excellent attributes of a naval officer that he possessed, Kontroliotis ascended the career ladder very quickly, and in 1908 he became the adjutant general to the King of Greece, Georges I. In 1912, Greece, Serbia, Montenegro and Bulgaria declared war on the Ottoman Empire. Kontroliotis, being commander of the Aegean Sea Fleet at that time, played an important role in the approval of that decision by the Greek authorities. Popo Kudriotis. Konturiotis told Prime Minister Venizelos then, I'm not afraid of the Turkish fleet, even though its ships are more numerous than ours. I will be able to liberate the Aegean Sea with the help of valor and the bravery of Greek sailors alone. Kontroliotis attained the rank of Rear Admiral, and in the fall of 1912, he directed a series of successful amphibious operations that led to the capture of several key islands and enabled the establishment of Greek naval bases. Averov was the most modern ship of the Greek Navy, and even among the navies of all the opposing countries. The reasons why she became the Greek flagship are clear. Kontroliotis achieved fame and earned the people's love after liberating the Greek islands. However, having done so, the Admiral, his flagship, Averov, and the entire Greek fleet became the highest priority target for the enemy, and they didn't make the Greeks wait for too long. On December 16, ships of the Ottoman Empire set out to sea in order to fight off the Greek squadron that was blocking the Dardanelles. Kontroliotis spotted the enemy at 8.20 a.m. The Admiral lined up his main forces, comprising flagship Averov and three coastal defense battleships, and set out towards the enemy. The Turkish fleet, comprising two squadron battleships armed with two 80mm main caliber guns, was stronger. In addition, in specific conditions, they could be supported by coastal batteries. In the space of an hour, the Turkish ships approached the Greeks to a distance of 10 kilometers and fired first salvos at them. A minute later, the Greeks answered. At a range of 9 kilometers, these 234mm rifles opened fire. Built by the British firm of Armstrong, Known as the 9.2 inch, they were in common service with the Royal Navy at the beginning of the 20th century. Averoff mounted four of these guns in two twin turrets. And indeed, the convex shape of the roof of the turret also belies their British origin. There were 18 people in the gun houses, and they were capable of servicing the rifles so quickly that every barrel could fire around every eight seconds. A 
some point, the fight, known as the Battle of Eli, turned into a fight that pitted Averroff against the entire Turkish squadron. Since our other ships were older and much slower than the flagship, when Turiotis had to speed up with his ship Averroff, leave the other ships behind and head into battle against the Turkish forces alone. Accurate salvos from Averov, combined with daring maneuvers by Konturiotis, who led the cruiser right up to the Turkish flagship in order to split the enemy squadron in half, caught the Turks cold. The Turkish squadron focused their fire on Averov, but their shells failed to reach their target. The gunmen on the Greek cruiser were more accurate. The Turkish formation was soon broken up, and they hurried to hide in the Dardanelles. During the battle, the ship was caught in a crossfire between the Turkish coastal batteries and her surface vessels, and she did take three hits, although none of them were serious. Averoff was pretty well protected. Her main belt was 20 centimeters thick, and she had an additional 18 centimeters covering her vital spaces, such as the barbettes. Indeed, the armor was of a new cemented type, and although it was only half as thick as the 40 centimeters of the old iron Turkish battleships, it still provided a lot more protection. And indeed, with the new armaments and protection, when the ship arrived, the Greeks christened her a Therikto, a battleship. That was the first victory of the Greek Navy. Basically, it was a victory of one ship, Averov, with Kunturiotis at her helm. A month later, on January the 18th, 1913, the Turkish squadron set out to sea again, and a second battle broke out. The second battle also turned into a duel between Averov and the entire Turkish fleet. But the results were even more disastrous for the Turks. The Turkish fleet found themselves blocked in the Dardanelles, and their ships took severe damage. Despite the focused fire of the Turkish guns, only two men were killed and eight wounded on board Averov. Those men were the only crew losses the ship suffered in the entire time of her service. After the battle, which would be historically known as the Battle of Lemnos, the Turkish fleet entirely lost its combat capabilities, and the Greek forces, led by Averov, became the masters of the Aegean Sea. Kontoriotis' victories over the Turkish fleet brought the fame of a national hero for the admiral, and his cruiser became known as the Menace of the Aegean Sea. Averroff hardly took part in combat in World War I, but in 1919, the Third Greco-Turkish War broke out. The cruiser supported Allied troops and helped evacuate the Greeks from Turkey in 1922, when the battle met its unfortunate end. Averroff underwent a major overhaul and upgrade in France between 1925 to 1927. The torpedo tubes and some guns of her secondary armament were demounted from the ship, while a new fire control system and anti-aircraft armament were installed. The old propulsion remained, as the cost of replacing it was considered to be unreasonably expensive for such an old ship. Now, by this point, most fleets in the world had moved to a liquid fuel system, but on Averroff, coal was retained, and you can imagine how pleasant it would have been in the heat for the stokers to take the coal from the bunkers put them into the fireboxes, and then you had to take the ash out from underneath, and that got extracted by use of an elevator at the top. There were 22 of these water-filled boilers in two engine compartments to provide a little bit of redundancy in case of battle damage. And if you look at it, Averroff is something of a multinational ship. The hull and armor are Italian, the boilers and engines are French, the generators are German, and the armament, British. The English guns of the Greek ironclad had their chance to serve the crown in the next world war, which Greece entered as an ally of Great Britain. When combat began in 1940, the Greek fleet and its irreplaceable flagship Yorgos Averov escorted convoys transporting troops and all needed supplies for the citizens of the Greek islands and protected the coastline from the enemy. In April of 1941, Germany invaded Greece and the Luftwaffe paid particular attention to the Hellenic Navy, sinking a number of ships at anchor to include the old battleship Kilkis. Averroff was not left alone from the attentions. 
Indeed, the German attacks are so fierce that the anti-aircraft gunners would come to know this as the deadly watch. The German advance is so rapid that the remnants of the fleet were forced to relocate to Crete and then Alexandria. But naval headquarters ordered Averoff to be scuttled on the premise that she was too old to be of military value and there seemed little merit in giving the enemy a prize of the hero of the Balkan Wars. However, the crew on their own decided to ignore this order and made their own break for Alexandria. At night on April 18, the cruiser's commander, Ionis Vlakopoulos, and a few crew members approached a closed harbour boom on a rowboat. The harbour boom was used to protect the ship at its station. Using axes and handsaws, the sailors cut through the harbour boom so Averoff could set out to sea. On April 23, the cruiser arrived in Alexandria and became part of the British Mediterranean forces. Greece capitulated on the same day and the government left the country. In August of 1941, the ship, now under British operational control, was sent to the Indian Ocean for convoy service, where she remained, based out of Bombay, until the end of 1942. Now at this point, the 30-year-old ship is making 12 to 16 knots, which for a cruiser is an indicator as to her state. Even though in the 1925 to 1927 refit, her original Belleville boilers had been replaced by like new ones. However, that didn't prevent cruiser Averoff from fulfilling her combat duties. From November 1942, she patrolled the entrance to the Suez Canal. Once the war was over and the Germans had left Greece, Averoff, as a flagship of the Greek Navy, transported the Greek government back from exile, here, to Felero. The day following the cruiser's arrival, on October the 17th, 1944, an official ceremony of raising the Greek flag in the Acropolis was organized, involving the Prime Minister of that time, Yorgos Papandreou. The flag, which was raised on the sacred mountain and symbolized the birth of a new free Greece, was the flag of cruiser Averoff. From 1945 until 1952, Averoff was stationed at Salamis Naval Base and used for allocating the naval headquarters. The schedule of all ships of the Greek Navy of that time is still preserved on a barbette of the main rear turret. Patrol ships, corvettes, auxiliary vessels, destroyers and submarines were marked on it. For example, the commander had the following information. A patrol ship, designated time of departure, where the ship was headed, arrival, designated time of arrival, and a signal for the ship to set out to sea. In 1984, the cruiser was towed to her current station, and her status was changed to that of a museum ship. Averoff still remains the flagship of the Greek Navy, and her crew carry out actual military service. Every day we work to preserve the ship and keep her alive. It requires a lot of effort and money, but it requires love before everything else. If you don't love what you do, you won't make much of it. But my crew and I, we all love this ship. In December 2017, when cruiser Averoff was leaving Saloniki, where she had taken part in the festivities dedicated to the anniversary of liberating North Greece from the Ottoman rule, many citizens asked the sailors to stay. They felt safe when they saw Averoff in the port. Fate has generally smiled upon the history of this ship. Averoff survived five wars and was originally funded by donations from private Greek citizens and 70 years later was again rebuilt by donations from the public. As a result, she can rightfully be described as a national treasure. It's kind of hard to think of a nation with a greater maritime tradition than that of Greece, the bond between men and the sea. And as the Greek historian and author Dimitris Fotiadis once said, Without the fleet, we cannot see freedom. <laughs>